Hello and welcome to the Tennessee World Affairs Council Distinguished Visiting Speaker Program. I'm Patrick Ryan, President of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. We're here today with Consul General James Hill. He represents Canada in the Southeast United States. Consul General, welcome and uh, uh, welcome back to Nashville. I understand you, you uh, have been here before and enjoy uh, visiting our city. Uh, thank you and thank you for the invitation to speak. And, and indeed, uh, Nashville and I are frequent interlocutors, I will say the state of Tennessee writ large. Uh, it was my very first visit uh, a week after I arrived uh, into my assignment, and uh, here I am again, and there have been many visits in between. Well, great. Well, we're going to cover uh, the U.S. Uh, relationship with Canada and the Tennessee relationship, the economic um, uh, benefits that both sides accrue uh, from a, a very large chunk of the uh, business uh, piece that uh, the United States and Canada enjoy together. And then we'll talk a little bit about the international uh, environment and what's going on in the world. Um, and you are well versed in what's going on in the world, having served in uh, many continents, many countries, uh, in many posts. Why don't you uh, start by giving us a sense of your background? You, you were uh, raised in Saskatchewan. And, uh, and now you're, you're here in Tennessee. What, what's happened in between those two points? Uh, uh, I guess a life has happened in between them. Uh, but yes, indeed, I'm, I'm from Weyburn, Saskatchewan. Uh, and to put that in geographic perspective, that's due north of western North Dakota. Uh, so uh, about 48 miles from the border. And uh, I grew up in a small prairie town. Uh, however, I had a, a family that was influenced by a number of international factors, either travel or education, and uh, so I had a curiosity for the world, and that led me to uh, a career in diplomacy. Well, great. Well, uh, and now you're in Atlanta representing Canada in the southeast United States, covering a number of states which include uh, Tennessee. Um, tell us a little bit about the uh, relationship between Canada and the state of Tennessee, the importance of the trade. Uh, Tennessee is a large uh, chunk of the U.S.-Canada uh, trade. I understand it's over $14 billion uh, between the, our state and, uh, and Canada. Uh, fill in the, uh, the, the outlines of, of what that means to, to both sides, if you could. Yeah, I mean, the Canada-U.S. relationship is the largest commercial relationship that we have with any, any country. And, um, you know, and, it, and that is in the, in the trillion-dollar uh, area. Uh, but uh, the, state, the relationship with the state of Tennessee is extremely large as well. It's $14.9 billion dollars. That's larger than our trading relationship with France, with the UK, with the France and UK combined. Uh, so the nature of our relationship with the US is huge. 75% of our uh, exports are with the US. And the nature of our uh, trading relationship and investment relationship with Tennessee is a, a, a microcosm of that. But it's a very large and very uh, multi-sector, very deep and uh, very robust relationship. When you're talking about a, a, a state to country late relationship of 14.9 billion, you want to make sure that you're doing everything possible to nurture it, to support it, to profile it, and to give it the foundation for it to continue to be a, a robust, mutually beneficial uh, type of uh, engagement. And that's the real interesting thing about the Tennessee-Canada relationship. It's not one-sided at all. A little bit more in your favor, uh, you know, kudos for that. Uh, but it's very balanced and continues to be so, and uh, that's what we, uh, we like to see. What are the sectors represented in that uh, trade? Where, where are the, uh, the bits and pieces? It really is multi-sectoral, uh, but it won't be, uh, come as a huge surprise uh, for you to hear that the auto sector plays a, a, a large role in that. And it's, you know, it's interesting in that you know, when we first had a diplomatic mission responsible for this area, there didn't exist an auto sector. There was no attention to this area. And now it's the largest component of a 14, nearly $15 billion uh, trading relationship. So, of course, we don't make cars. Uh, there's no uh, Canadian auto plant here. 
But there are Canadian auto uh, parts uh, investors. Magma International, for one, is the third largest auto parts supplier in the world, and it has a robust uh, presence here in the state of Tennessee, supplying and uh, the multiple uh, automobile manufacturers who uh, exist here and who have developed uh, that sector here for within the state and within the region, frankly, because it's not state specific, although Tennessee certainly benefits from that. And when you're looking at the the companion portion of that, what are we looking, what are we bringing from the state into Canada? Of course, <laughs> our components go into the cars, uh, the cars come back to Canada. So there's a large export of automobiles back into the Canada, the finished product, if you will. Any other sectors stand out? Yeah, I mean, energy uh, is, a, is a big one with, with uh, uh, pipelines, uh, uh, clean tech uh, is important. Uh, um, there is a, uh, a traditional sector that we don't, we never overlook, uh, agriculture, creative industries. Nashville is a, a hub for that, and not only on a music, but on a film and production level. These are really uh, uh, key sectors. Forestry is uh, an element where Canada has done a, a large amount of investment and still engages uh, uh, in imports and exports in that sector. So as I say, it's really a multi-sectoral involvement with the state, and that's what produces a, a healthy and balanced trading relationship. I didn't uh, mention tourism, but of course uh, the flow of uh, people back and forth and the flow of businesses uh, back and forth, uh, courtesy of uh, air routes and, 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 and rail routes, uh, is also a, a key component. Uh, Nashville is very well served, for example, by Canadian Airlines. So the four airlines, five destinations, are soon to be five destinations in Canada. And where goes uh, air links and, and, and rail links? Uh, it was a burgeoning uh, commercial and an investment relationship. I think the air links uh, between Nashville and Canada were what gave uh, Nashville International the international uh, until just recently. <laughs> well, everybody needs a, a starting point. Sure, but, sure. Uh, Nashville has done very well in terms of its growth and its profile uh, in that regard. What do you see as uh, the future? Uh, uh, what, what's trending in, in Canada, Tennessee? A business to business ties. Any any new sectors or just expansion of existing ties? Uh, no, I mean that, that's the interesting thing about business relationships. They're always evolving, and um, uh, although you know, there's a large number of uh, a large amount of commodity exports, the nature of those commodities are also set to change with the growth uh, and the evolution of the EV sector and the role that Tennessee and this region is going to play in that uh, has produced the attention and the, uh, and the focus on rare earths and, and, and lithium and new minerals that are component parts of that. And that, has, uh, that sector is set, set to take off, not only in terms of raw materials, but also in component parts that are going to then service the EV sec uh, the sector. So. Uh, a shift in the raw materials that come here, a shift in some of the, the, the finished products that, that, that come here and, and feed into the supply chain in, in the Tennessee economy. Now, beyond Tennessee, the region uh, has important relationships with Canada. Tell us a little bit about the Sioux CP relationship. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, the Sioux CP, which is Southeast U.S. states, Canadian provinces, that's the CP portion of that, has been around since the early uh, 2000, uh, 2000s, and it is a state to province entity that began on uh, to facilitate and promote the, the political policy, trade policy, commercial policy element of the relationship between those states and to grow the uh, integration, the economic integration uh, between the member uh, states and the member provinces. It also it has evolved to become not only a policy element but a, a business element and an investment element. So although there was a pause in uh, its activity uh, during COVID, it came back with a, a bang last year in its first uh, post-COVID entity uh, iteration rather in uh, Savannah. 
and it will move to, as is its policy, move back to a Canadian uh, hosted um, location this year, and that'll be St. John's, Newfoundland. So it is a state provincial uh, organization that promotes business and, and, and policy that is supporting business between those U.S. Uh, states and Canadian provinces. Governors and premiers? Governors and premiers are at the tip top of, the, of that little food chain, but we uh, uh, encourage a, 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 a wide range of participants from small to medium lo uh, to large multinationals. And those uh, 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 those individuals who are active in in the administration and uh, promotion of business, whether that's uh, chambers, whether that's government departments of commerce, it is you know it really tries to bring in all players who are relevant to building and and, and uh, uh, economies and and allowing the trading and business relationship to flourish. At the national level, uh, talk, continue to talk about structures between uh, the countries. Uh, we know about NAFTA, mm -hmm. and now we have the USMCA or uh, the CUSMA, as it's referred to, yeah. from north of the border. Um, give us uh, kind of a sketch out for those who may not be familiar with how all that evolved and where it stands now. Yeah, so NAFTA was uh, a 25-year-old uh, free trade agreement. Uh, that was uh, actually predated by the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement uh, before Mexico was brought into it, which was also predated by the Auto Pact from the mid-60s. So uh, it was a belief and an acknowledgement that our North American, in this case, economies thrive and are able to um, grow because of the economic integration and the component parts that each country is bringing to it. So developing a structure within a North American context for, for the free trade of goods and services. Uh, NAFTA was great, but free trade agreements are, uh, by their very definition, need to be evergreen. And the KUSMA, or the USMCA, was that evergreening element of a very productive and a very valuable free trade agreement that grew the North America economy, but was uh, in line for a refresh. So uh, in, in the middle of COVID, in July of 2020, the new USMCA came into effect and set the stage for a, a, a new generation of business uh, to take place and providing the conditions and the parameters to deal with that. If you think at the time of the birth of the original MCA, uh, the original NAFTA or, uh, or free trade agreement, companies like Amazon didn't exist. The digital economy didn't exist. And if exa Amazon existed, they were selling books. You know, so it was a totally different world. Borders were borders. Yeah. Uh, so as economies evolve and as business evolves, you have to have a free trade agreement that is uh, going to address the reality uh, of that evolution. And that's what the USMCA provides. You know, it also has uh, dispute rec uh, um, resolution mechanisms. Uh, it, you, free trade uh, agreements are great, but sometimes there is a difference of opinion on, on, on what should happen and what sector is uh, uh, behaving good or bad or needs some uh, oversight a address. And, you know, like any good family, there are uh, disagreements, and the USMCA has a provision to deal with those disagreements. And, of course, there are elements before, uh, before its jurisdiction. So as, as a practical matter, what, what does that mean for a business? It's not like uh, Tennessee making something and sending it to Kentucky. There still are rules governing... Uh, there are rules. And, and in the last administration, we had uh, dispute over tariffs and... Right. I mean, there are rules, but the idea is that that for commercial matters, you're trying to make the borders as irrelevant as possible, that you are acknowledging that a, a vibrant and functional economy in a North American sense is one that's integrated and is taking advantage of the, uh, the strengths and attributes of all three component parts to make all three stronger. So if you can create an, a, a, a playing field where 
your product or your service isn't encumbered by tariffs or, or uh, taxes, then you have a much better, uh, um, much healthier economy and your supply chains are that much more effective and efficient. Calling on the resources of all three makes sure that you're, you're taking the benefits of, uh, and the assets of all three and creating the best business environment possible. On the political front, the bilateral relationship, we have brotherly relations across the longest uh, border uh, between two countries in the world and is uh, undefended on either side. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, th this is two different countries and have uh, interests that may not always agree. What are some of the issues that are currently on the table between uh, Washington and Ottawa? Um, well, first of all, you're right. I mean, it's a brotherly, cordial relationship that continues to be vibrant and productive irrespective of what administration happens to be in Ottawa or Washington. So that's the, the nature of it. There's just a, a bedrock of understanding and, and common goodwill that supports it. But, you know, there are always issues between us and, uh, you know, softwood lumber has always been an issue that continues to uh, be before various trade uh, mechanisms to try and resolve or modify or manage dairy. What's, what's the issue there? Oh, it's a rather complex and long one, but I'll put it in these terms, that, that, that whether a U.S. business uh, or, or forestry products think that Canadian uh, forestry products are unfairly subsidized because of stumpage fees, the, the, what you're paying to cut down the, the tree and paying to the government. So... Uh, the, Does sound complicated. The, the sectors are just managed very differently, and most of the forestry areas are in the U.S. are small and privately held, whereas the much of the forest in Canada is crown owned or publicly owned and managed in a different way. So the, those differences produce a sense of unfair cost of the lum Canadian lumber in the U.S. market. And therefore, it's been continually a subject of challenge by U.S. producers. Uh, it was an issue when I started in the Foreign Service. It's an issue that continues many years later uh, mm -hmm. to this point. Uh, but an interesting sidebar to that is, <laughs> as a result of many of, many of the challenges uh, uh, that Canadian producers have, uh, uh, have uh, faced, there's been an inordinate amount of foreign direct investment by Canadian uh, forest product companies in the U.S. markets. Uh, so if you can't beat them, join them, uh, is one element of the, uh, of the strategy. Markets will adapt. Yeah, markets will adapt. And you mentioned dairy. Dairy has always been an issue, and it was certainly, uh, we have, again, two different management systems uh, in terms of, of, of that commodity. It was a subject in uh, the USMCA negotiations. It was one that had a, a, a good deal of public um, uh, profile. And again, it's a complicated issue in terms of how much dairy you, you're allowing your, your uh, producers to create, and is there a market for that? And some things that can be very sensitive in terms of market protection or producer protection and trying to come up with a, an access mechanism that uh, makes both sides happy uh, is difficult basically because there's, if you look at dairy as a whole, there's a way, there's way much over, there's a great deal uh, of overproduction that any amount of adjusting of the market ac access issues will still not address because if you've got too much dairy, you've got too much dairy. And if you're subsidizing that dairy, it's not going to correct itself. Right. An area that um, uh, less issues, uh, defense and security, the uh, Canada-United States relationship through the North American Air Defense and partnership in uh, NATO. Can you talk about uh, the a relationship uh, in defense and security, the, the bilateral interests in working together? Yeah, um, this is something that's got a long and storied and very valuable history to it. Um, Canadian uh, 
military have been in, uh, have had a very productive and cordial and essential relationship with, with U.S. military in terms of the de defense of uh, and, and protection of it, uh, nor common North American interests. So that is a, a very good example of uh, a, a yet another very good example of cooperation and um, engagement that exists absolutely irrespective of what administration might be in Washington or Ottawa because the value in, in, in protecting our common North American interests is, is a, a, an override for everything. And so Canadian uh, armed forces are embedded in throughout the U.S. in uh, um, uh, facilities and institutions here that can help contribute to that common defense of our North American interests. And, you know, it's, it, it's interest vis-a-vis -vis North America, but it's also, our, you know, global interests as well, where there's geopolitical shift elsewhere in the world. It's helpful to know that your closest and most valuable uh, neighbor, uh, I'll say, and I include the geographical sense of that, has a common vision and understanding and awareness of your capabilities. Uh, it only serves to make both entities stronger. Of course, we're a much smaller entity, uh, but I think we, we, we acknowledge the importance of cooperation and the contribution that Canada can and should make uh, to the partnership. Well, certainly the geographic relationship is important to the common defense. The, uh, the emergence of uh, the Indo-Pacific as an area of uh, increasing tumult um, in, in recent years is, has got uh, uh, U.S. policymakers reassessing the relationship with China and increasing concern with North Korea and, and the Indo-Pacific is becoming increasingly important. How does Canada view the developments there and, and uh, any responsibilities for reacting to uh, those developments? Uh, well, you mentioned China, and certainly the, the relationship with China is viewed um, as a challenging one, uh, and one that has uh, become more challenging uh, through the, the last decade. Um, it, it's an essential partner. We, like all uh, uh, bilateral relationship, we acknowledge the, the importance of China, but managing that relationship has become uh, more and more, more challenging. Uh, as a part of our address of the Indo-Pacific and, and examination of where our interests and uh, attention needs to lie, Canada has just launched an Indo-Pacific strategy uh, with a greater focus on India, but, the, uh, but also uh, the region as a whole. So greater attention on, uh, in, in terms of the diplomatic presence, the military presence, the commercial presence, the development assistance presence. So if you want to go online, you can certainly find all the details of our Indo-Pacific strategy and sort of the comprehensive nature of it. You know, I, I, somebody says, is, a, is it a pivot away from China? It is an acknowledgement that there are other elements within the region that uh, where the relationship needs to be enhanced and strengthened. And that that uh, those elements are external to what, what we were doing with China. So it, it sounds like there's a, a common assessment of uh, concern about China's yeah sure and the Indo-Pacific strategy that was launched is a you know is a it was a response to that and it's a pillar of our foreign policy. Let's turn to uh, European affairs uh, as a NATO partner. Uh, Canada is concerned as other NATO partners are with the uh, unprovoked war. Um, in uh, Ukraine, the Russian invasion uh, about a year ago. Uh, what, what's been uh, the reaction uh, from Canada in terms of the NATO response and, and just the uh, Canadian view of the world and what's happening in European theater? Yes, it's a very troublesome and very worrisome uh, development, unfortunately. Um, it has really rocked the, the, sort of the international order and it has provoked it has propelled Canada and NATO as a, uh, an entity to re-examine it, uh, its preparedness for, for such a, a geopolitical development. And I, I would say all member states were 
I'm prepared in the sense that you know the scenarios that are played out. Uh, this one probably had the least amount of attention to uh, its probability, uh, but uh, we are at, uh, we can certainly condemn what has happened in the strongest terms. Russia is the aggressor in this situation. Uh, Ukraine is the uh, the victim. We are wholeheartedly supporting the effort in Ukraine and the NATO effort in Ukraine to help meet the Russian aggression. And that scale uh, and the level of commitment to it has only increased since the war has begun. Before it was um, you know, kind words, uh, uh, solidarity, uh, and it is through the increased Russian uh, uh, aggression and the its inability to admit its error and back off, uh, Canada, together with its NATO allies, have stepped up and, and increased the level of commitment uh, to the country, to, to Ukraine, uh, in the face of this unprovoked Russian aggression. And it will continue to, uh, to do so. You know, Canada is part of that coalition who is now contributing uh, upwards of, uh, uh, if I have the number, 300 tanks in, in, a, in a collective to, to the, to the uh, Ukrainian war effort. If at the beginning, or even prior to, to the invasion, when there was sable rattling, you had asked anybody if such a scenario could ever come to pass, with that level of, of Western solidarity and commitment, hardcore commitment, with more than just words, would ever be a likely scenario people would have laughed at you. But the world is a strange place, and uh, uh, I'm thankful for the, the level of, of commitment, but uh, the acknowledgement of the, the danger that not addressing Russian aggression presents. And in that regard, I must say that I'm very, uh, I don't know if the relieved, but, or pleased, or happy, whatever descriptor you want to use of the US uh, commitment bipartisan commitment uh, to supporting Ukraine in, in, in its fight against Russian aggression. Uh, its consequences can uh, hold the potential for, for being monumental. So it's, it's beyond our, uh, just what is Ukraine experience in terms of the trauma of war. It's the potential trigger in, in changing a geopolitical landscape. And the one that Russia is tending, uh, trending towards isn't one that uh, suits Western democracies very well at all. Well, we're certainly in uh, an era of the unthinkable uh, coming about. Um, I'll, I'll expand a little bit on that. We, you know, Russia, Ukraine, is certainly, and China is certainly uh, uh, central issues. But uh, uh, I'd like to share with, uh, with our audience that you've, you've held a number of uh, the most interesting posts in some of the most challenging countries around the world, Iran, Kuwait, Libya, Mozambique, South and Central America, Seattle. Uh, that, that was probably uh, yeah. somewhat challenging. Uh, given the scope of your, your global experience, uh, can you share uh, your perspectives and assessments on the global landscape? And, and sort of, a, uh, are we in a transformational age or you know, the cold, post-Cold War era is over, we're in new uh, great power conflicts. Um, uh, can you just help us understand the, the major economic, political, and security challenges we seem uh, to see? I guess the basic question is, what's going on in the world? Yeah. Well, the world, world is, is a, a much more, unfortunately, troubled place than one would like to, one would hope for. And you know, Western-style democracies are certainly in the minority, and the erosion of democratic principles, even amongst players who, you know, were trending towards or certainly classified as democracies, are also worsened. Uh, uh, so, the geopolitical shift in terms of uh, fighting for or ensuring that democratic principles uh, in our own countries are solid, let alone those in emerging economies and emerging democracies are. Uh, have, uh, have traction is becoming more and more 
difficult. So if, it, if, if a pendulum, if you're looking at a pendulum, it's certainly not swinging towards uh, uh, you know, the growth of democracy with strong governance institutions and a voice for every citizen in that country. Uh, you know, it, I can't tell you why <laughs> that has happened. I can't go into that type of detail. But, um, you know, it, it's incumbent upon countries who, who value that type of governance structure to ensure, first of all, our own house is in order and that those institutions are unchallenged and, and democracy uh, is rooted in, in how we are structured and governed and that we have a credible uh, platform then to project that in and support that in, in, in other geopolitical theaters around the world. But it's a challenge. There are the, the growth of dictatorships and totalitarianism and the ability uh, or the awareness of, of regimes to, to challenge the world order and the willingness to do that is unfortunately growing. And um, you know that's something that we, in terms of Western democracies, ha have to take note of and, uh, and, and more to the point, take action on. Well, thank you for uh, for your time today. I, I'll uh, note that um, this is the 50th anniversary year of the, the Consul General uh, in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I'll also note that the trade between Canada and Tennessee exceeds that of Canada and Georgia. So hopefully soon enough the uh, consulate will be moving to Nashville. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you for the, the 50th anniversary shout out. We're very proud that we've been here since the early 70s when the region was less international, let's say. Uh, and we've uh, been a, a solid and, and reliable partner in the economic growth and the shift of these economies, both in Canada and in the U.S. Southeast and Tennessee over the years. Yes, it's interesting uh, the, the, to see the uh, diamond, dynamism of the Tennessee and economy and uh, uh, how it's, it's stepped ahead of um, that of Georgia, but equally vibrant and, and growing. Uh, it just speaks well to the region as a whole, and you know we're here frequently. We'd love to have a presence here. Uh, we do have an honorary council within in within the state, and we're looking to uh, sort of find a mechanism to grow our, our in-state presence, and uh, that's actually something we're we're looking at. Well, great. Well, it's uh, three years to this month that we had a podcast with uh, Consul General Nadia Theodore. And it was three years to the month before that that we had an interview with uh, Consul General Louise Blaze. And we are here with you in February 2023. Hopefully it won't be three years before we have another opportunity to, to talk about the important relationship between Tennessee and Canada and the United States and Canada. Agreed. We're always here. We're always at your disposal. Well, thank you. We've been talking with Consul General of Canada, James Hill. Uh, he's here in Nashville for a visit. Uh, Tennessee is part of the territory he covers as the Consul General for Canada to the Southeast United States. Thanks again, Consul General, and enjoy the rest of your trip in Nashville. Thank you very much. Thank you.